My name is John LaBelle. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. I blog at creativitydiscourse.com, review movies from a mythological point of view at cinemadiscourse.com, and you can reach me at John LaBelle at macmac.com. We're talking today about the architect Louis, I Louis Icahn and his uh, approach to architecture as philosophy or how to live in the modern world. Uh, in outline, we'll talk briefly about how do we live in the modern world, who is Louis Kahn. We'll talk about Beaux-Arts architecture, which is the approach to architecture that Kahn studied, then modern architecture, finding a third way in archetypes, and then Kahn's spiritual philosophy. So, how do we live in the modern world? Do we live in traditions which give us a rootedness but have questionable relevance to a, a world rich with our scientific knowledge? Or do we live in a contemporary material reality, uh, but then missing those traditions? Or is there a third way? We see that contrast in architecture. There are a lot of uh, historically rooted styles, but we'll just focus on Beaux-Arts uh, architecture in this discussion. So <clears throat> Beaux-Arts monumentality brought us the solidity of Rome in the Renaissance, but was that relevant to our democratic industrial 20th century? Uh, modern architecture rejected this celebration of the past. A famous quote from the architectural critic Lewis Mumford, if it's a monument, it's not modern, and if it's modern, it cannot be a monument. So, we'll get back to that as our story unfolds. But now, very briefly, who is Louis Kahn? So, Louis Kahn is an architecture of major stature, sometimes regarded as maybe the second most important American architect after Frank Lloyd Wright. He was born in Estonia to a poor family and came to the United States, to Philadelphia, when he was five. <coughs> he uh, studied architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, which at that time had a Beaux-Arts program. He was there between 1920 and 1924. Graduated in 1924, just as the Beaux-Arts was fading and modern architecture was rising. After he graduated, the country entered the Great Depression and uh, Kahn's few buildings were based on a kind of social approach to architecture and were very undistinguished. Kahn struggled with monumentality. Um, if we're rejecting this historical Beaux-Arts monumentality, what are our values? What do we stand for? What should our architecture be uh, addressing? And as a result of this struggle, he eventually produced a profound spiritual philosophy and between 1957 and when he died in 1974, designed a series of buildings considered some of the finest of the 20th century. Let's just look at his buildings. We'll uh, just look a little bit at his first building of major importance. It's called the Medical Towers Research Laboratories at the University of Pennsylvania, and then several others. So the building is distinguished by being highly articulated. He's showing us the structure, the air handling ducts, uh, very much in contrast to a building being built at just the same time, Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building in Manhattan, which was very um, uh, simplified, clearly within a sheath of bronze and glass. So let's see how Kahn arrives at this articulation. He has three pavilions, uh, and each of these is an open, flexible laboratory. 
and they are all three linked to a central core with central services, stairs, elevators, bathrooms, and each is served by, you see these squares here, those are the towers that have stairs or uh, air handling ducts. So Khan starts by saying there are two parts to science. One is measurement. That takes place at the laboratory table, experiment, and we have here uh, an area that we want to be flexible, no columns interrupting. And then Kahn says, after making uh, measurements, the scientist wants to go to the light. And so at the perimeter where the windows are, are the desks to then review the results of the experiments and render them into a theory. Now, we don't want to interrupt any of this with structure, so the columns go uh, on the perimeter. And we don't want to interrupt our views from the corners, so the columns are at the third points and avoid the corners. We then span between the columns and from the columns out to the corners by cantilevers with our beams to provide our structure. We then have our stairs and air ducts. Very typically in a, in a high-rise building, those will be in the center. But remember, we wanted our center clear for our laboratories. So those, we don't want to put those in the corners, obviously. That'll disrupt our views. So they go between the columns in these third points. And we have three of these. And then all three of these share a central core that has stairs, toilets, storeroom, uh, etc. So there's a very strong logic to the way Khan arrives at his building. And Khan liked to say, the building is the record of the making of the building. So here we are, he leaves out one of these pavilions for the entrance. The stairs are on the other side, but get a better view here. And as you come up into this uh, um, area before going through the doors, you look up, and the whole story I just told you is right there. Uh, so the building communicates to us how it is made. The next important uh, building by Khan is his Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. Jonas Salk had seen Khan lecture, uh, had been uh, become famous for his development of the Salk polio vaccine and was building a research laboratory and asked Khan to be his architect and produce this uh, magnificent building. This is the Phillips Exeter Academy Library and we have a very uh, boxy brick building on the outside. This brick is not veneer but is structural and then inside the building explodes up into a, a light court uh, open at the center of the building. This is a National Assembly building in Dhaka, Bangladesh, a legislative building, and Khan um, has a huge complex of support around this central uh, meeting hall for the Congress and was planning to use these huge beams spanning above it to sort of bounce the light and bring it in, but it proved uh, finished after Khan died and proved these beams proved too heavy and were, it was done instead with a uh, light thin shell. Many people regard this <coughs> Excuse me, as Khan's most beautiful building, Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. And he has a series of uh, vault like shapes and open down the center um, to let light in, and then these reflectors to wash the light over the exposed concrete of the interior vault. And uh, Khan's last building that he finished, um, well, it was finished just after he died. The Yale Center for British Art at Yale University. On the outside, concrete and 
stainless steel. Inside, uh, the concrete structure is exposed, and infill panels are of a light oak wood. And in the entrance court, we look up to skylights uh, at the top. One of uh, Kahn's uh, earlier projects from 1974, just now finished in Manhattan, Franklin D. Roosevelt for Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island at the tip. Now, that's a very quick overview of Kahn's architecture. Looking at these buildings in detail would be a, a whole other discussion but we're talking about something else here, which is Kant's spiritual philosophy. And let's sort of work our way toward that and start with a very briefly looking at Beaux-Arts architecture. Now, uh, Kant's teacher, the chief critic at the University of Pennsylvania when he was there was Paul Philippe Cray, a French Beaux-Arts master who had come uh, to teach in the United States and to have uh, quite a successful practice doing some magnificent uh, buildings. On the top is the Pan Am building in Washington, D.C. Beautiful little building, 1903, early in Cray's career. And then here we have 1929, also in Washington, the Shakespeare Folger Library, a form of Beaux-Arts called strip classicism. And Kahn actually worked for Cray on this building. So, and then while Kahn was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, the uh, Philadelphia Museum was under construction. And you can see how something this massive would be very influential on the students at the school. Now, um, very quickly, let's define what we mean by Beaux-Arts. We begin with the École des Beaux-Arts is a school of architecture, painting, and sculpture in Paris. Now, it was very influential on American architecture because in the um, uh, mid to late 1800s, as architectural careers were starting to flourish in the United States, there were no architecture schools, and most of the famous architects of the uh, late 1800s actually studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. It was free and open to any applicant uh, as long as you could pass the tests. So the term Beaux-Arts comes from this school. And then we have the term a Beaux-Arts education. Well, that was the education practice at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. But then as they began to form the, the schools in America, they uh, adopted many aspects of the uh, educational model of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And one of the schools that uh, adopted this model was the University of Pennsylvania, where Kahn studied. The approach was used historical models, particularly uh, Rome, Renaissance and Baroque, and Neoclassical. And finally, the term Beaux-Arts architecture. Well, that's the architecture that came from this education, characterized by formal planning, uh, monumentality, and historical styles. And in New York, examples would be the Metropolitan Museum, Grand Central Station, the New York Public Library, and the Washington Square Arch. So we have uh, in New York these magnificent examples of Beaux-Arts architecture. And again, it would be a lot of detail to go into to describe what this architecture was trying to do, but uh, very briefly and very generally, what it was trying to do was the following. So observe that it is using uh, a vocabulary from Greece, Rome, the Renaissance, and the Baroque, namely columns, arches, and domes. So this is sort of Roman architecture, which uses a Greek vocabulary as adopted by 
the Renaissance and the Baroque. Now, what is this saying? Uh, why would you build an architecture like this? Here we have the uh, 42nd Street Library in this Beaux-Arts sort of Roman Renaissance Baroque style. What's it saying? Well, it's saying that um, the it's referring to the people of the Iliad and the Odyssey, ancient Greeks, and saying that our stories are built on theirs, that it references us to Plato and Aristotle and says that our philosophy was built on theirs. It refers to Greek and Renaissance humanism and says that our sense of what a person is is built on theirs. It ties us to Leonardo da Vinci and implies that our mechanics was built on his to Isaac Newton and implies that our science was built on his. It says that we are historically rooted. But is this really us? Do we really come from the Iliad and the Odyssey or from the Arthurian romances of the Middle Age? Is our philosophy built on that of Plato and Aristotle? Or is pragmatism something quite different? Do we accept Greek and Renaissance humanism? Or do we have a very different sense of what a person is today? Do, is our science and mechanics built on those of Leonardo and Isaac Newton? Or did science become quite something uh, different? So modern architecture felt that <coughs> it was not adequate or not even correct to see ourselves as built on these ancient cultures. And uh, it rejected monumentality as a glorification of an irrelevant past. So here we see on the right above uh, John Russell Pope's National Gallery in Washington, D.C., completed 1941. Frank Lloyd Wright was already in his fourth phase by then. And here we are doing a uh, Beaux-Arts building in Washington, based on, as we see below, the Pantheon, the Roman Pantheon. So, of course, it's much more than that, but, you know, we can say that the National Gallery is a Pantheon with two wings. Why are we building a Pantheon? Rome ended a long time ago. So, um, the feeling was that monumental buildings celebrate European culture by using classical vocabularies and by concretizing uh, the institutions of this European past and that that's just not the modern world. So as an alternative to this, we develop modern architecture. Now, this is a very simplified story, but um, we want to get to a, a point of how Kahn develops an alternative to both the Beaux-Arts and modern architecture. So here we are in 1953, uh, Lever House in New York, and we'll take that as uh, an exemplar of um, modern architecture. It's within the international style, and uh, it's uh, one of it's the first glass and steel skyscraper. Now, how do we arrive at this architecture? Let's start here with a chess set. So we look at the pieces in this chess set, and where do the designs come from? Well, they invoke the medieval world and fortifications and battle. So we have a king, a queen, a bishop, a knight, a rook or a castle, and a pawn or a foot soldier. So these chess pieces get their design through uh, their rootedness in the past. And then they bring that past into our world today. So modernism says, um, okay, suppose we want to play chess. 
Why would we need to evoke medieval knights? So this is a chess set designed at the Bauhaus and very different pieces. Now, where did the design of these pieces come from? Well, okay, they're abstract, they're geometric, a lot more than that. So we look closely, how does the um, knight or horse move? Well, it goes uh, over and then turns, right? Or forward and then turns. And so it moves in an L shape. And there we have the piece with that L in it uh, indicating that. How does the rook or castle move? It moves up or down, up and down, or back and forth. And so its rectilinearity shows that. How does the bishop move? It moves diagonally, and it's showing us that. And then how did the king and queen move? They can move in any direction. The queen as far as she wants, and the king one square at a time. So the shape of the pieces is, or the form, is derived from their functions, how they operate. And now let's see that idea applied to a building. This is the uh, a Bauhaus building, 1929 by Walter Gropius. And look at the model below, and we can see it's asymmetrical, dispersed uh, into the landscape. Say, so, okay, you know, it sort of has a very crisp, modern quality, but where specifically do these forms come from? See these four distinct parts of the building. Well, uh, first we have the studios. And the studios are like um, being seen like an industrial factory. So we have floor to ceiling glass, heavy concrete, uh, open loft spaces for our modern um, uh, industrial design studios. We have our classrooms. And the classrooms can be of any width. Right? I mean, we can have a wide classroom, a narrow classroom. So we have these strip windows with these um, bands dividing them. And we can put our petitions flexibly inside uh, based on how uh, big we want each classroom to be. We have our administration. And the administration bridges uh, between other elements of the school and ties them together. And finally, we have the dorms, studio dorms. And these are not like the classrooms, you know, bands of windows, but people's individual homes. And so they each have a little balcony and a distinct window to show the individual identity. If you're looking up there, you would be able to spot which one was yours. So the Bauhaus in particular, and much of modern architecture in general, receives its form in response to the activities going on inside. Oscar Schlemmer, uh, who did this famous painting of the stair at the Bauhaus that we can see at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, wrote for a Bauhaus exhibit, Reason and Science, Man's Greatest Powers, are the Regents, and the Engineer is the sedate executor of unlimited possibilities. Mathematics, structure, and mechanization are the elements, and power and money are the dictators of this modern phenomena of steel, concrete, glass, and electricity. Or as one of my professors uh, put it, uh, the modern architects threw themselves into the hands of the sanitary engineers. Um, that the architecture is nothing more nor less than a response to these mechanical aspects of life and construction. 
So there are two approaches. One is uh, historically rooted, but uh, irrelevant to perhaps to today, and the other seeing us in mechanistic material terms. Again, in architecture, uh, you can see right here in New York, the Metropolitan Museum, it's on an avenue, Fifth Avenue, in Central Park. You have a great stair announcing the importance of the activity as you go up into the building. It's using the columns, arches, and vaults of Rome, uh, showing that our culture is rooted in Rome. Now let's look at the Museum of Modern Art. It's on a side street, 53rd Street, not an avenue. There's no step up. You enter right in through a revolving door, just as you would into a department store. Uh, inside the lobby is not uh, monumental, doesn't have domes, but brings you right into the art and into the building. Now, Museum of Modern Art has been renovated quite a few times, but in the latest renovation, they made a point of preserving some aspects of this Goodwin and Stone original uh, facade. Now, here's a quote from uh, a German mystic monk, Angelinus of Salius, and he says, Of what use, Gabriel, your message to Mary, unless you can give the same message to me? Now, there's Fra Angelico's Annunciation, and Gabriel is telling Mary that she's pregnant with a child of God. What does our German mystic mean here? He does not mean that he wishes to be pregnant with the child of God. <clears throat> what he means is that what's the point of these stories of a tradition unless they are informative about ourselves, that the Spirit of God should be born in me. So if we can understand these traditions not literally, but metaphorically, then they can continue to be relevant in a scientific era. So here on the left, we have a Renaissance, uh, early Renaissance crucifixion. On the right is a painting by Monrian. And this is actually the same subject. The play between life and death, the vertical being life, the horizontal being death, and what do they mean to us today? Not from the point of view of one Middle Eastern culture, but as a universal archetypal idea that is accessible to everyone and accessible to us in our scientific age. So let's see what Kahn's approach to this was. So here we are, were in modern architecture rejecting monumentality. But then um, architects began to ask, okay, we're rejecting all this stuff, but what do we value? What do we want to recognize? What do we value? And how might we do so? What would be a new monumentality? And after struggling with this, for some time, Kahn suddenly stopped using the word monumentality and replaced it with order. And realized that he was looking for not a rootedness in a European past, but a for how architecture and a building and we ourselves can be rooted in our own nature, that quality of us or the building or the institution.
that makes it what it is. Now, how do we go about doing that? So, Kahn used this term order, and he said um, that he could not say what order is. Okay, does that mean we stop right there? Well, when you not being able to say what I'm going to say what order is. Order is the underlying principle of all things and the way in which things come into existence. Now, um, you just the, in that sense, order then transcends concept. So if you define something, that's a concept. Order transcends concepts. We can't define it. So how do you talk about something that you cannot talk about directly? And the answer is metaphor. So Kahn used the metaphor of silence and light. And he said, silence, the immeasurable, desire to be, desire to express, source of new need, meets light, the measurable, giver of all presence, by will, by law, the measure of things already made, at a threshold, which is inspiration, the sanctuary of art, the treasury of shadow. So, what we see in Kahn's philosophy is a notion of that there's a realm of potential. If we see a beautiful building on a hill, where was that building before it was there? Well, in one sense, that's a meaningless question. In another sense, it couldn't exist unless it had the potential to exist. So it was in the realm of potential. That's the realm of silence. We then, as an artist or architect, have a realization. Aha! This is what it should be. This, it's now in the realm of light. But then we've got to go further and actually make it happen. Whether it's a novel or a drawing or a building... And of course, when we start engaging with that reality, it's going to undergo a lot of change. And so, um, Kant says the final manifestation, realization, is realization in form, which means in nature. In other words, if we're going to build our building in brick, we now have to deal with brick or steel or concrete. In one of his very famous quotes, Kahn says, if you think of brick and you're consulting the orders, you consider the nature of brick. You say to brick, what do you want, brick? Brick says to you, I like an arch. You say to brick, arches are expensive and I can use a concrete lintel over an opening. What do you think of that brick? Brick says, I like an arch. Now, we look at Kahn's mystical writings and at first they seem opaque. Yes, it's nice poetry. Does it really make sense? And then we see these very strong parallels to other mystical traditions, particularly Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. So Lao Tzu writes, The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. In other words, you can't say what it is. Just the way you can't say what order is. Now, I'll, I'll say what the Tao is. Tao is the underlying principle of all things and the, the uh, principle through which things come into existence. Exactly what order is. He says, Ever desire less, one can see the mystery. Ever desiring, one can see the 10,000 things. Desireless and desiring. They are different in name, yet they are the same. And if we look at Khan, he says, I liken the emergence of light to a manifestation of two brothers, knowing quite well that there are not two brothers, nor even one. And Khan says, a great building in my opinion must begin with the unmeasurable, must go through measurable means when it is being designed, and in the end must be unmeasurable. And finally, 
A work is made in the urging sounds of industry, and when the dust settles, the pyramid, echoing silence, gives the sun its shadow. Now, this mystical philosophy of Khan, at first we might think of it as idiosyncratic, but then we find that he's in a very um, powerful tradition. Louis Sullivan wrote, The germ is the real thing, the seat of identity. Within its delicate mechanism lies the will to power, the function, which is to seek and eventually to find its full expression in form. <clears throat> so, when Sullivan used the term form follows function, which we also associate with Frank Lloyd Wright, <clears throat> he says, I do not mean the crude functionalism of the materialists. By function, he means the inner will, that which seeks to uh, find its full expression in form. And he has an image of a seed here, and there's the germ in the center. And the inner will, imagine an acorn. An acorn wants to be an oak tree, has inner will to be an oak tree. Now, we refer to DNA, but uh, speaking metaphorically. So there is this inner driving force. Frank Lloyd Wright said, deeper than the truths of philosophy or the laws of morality is a sense of honor. What would be the honor of a brick? That in the brick which makes the brick a brick. In other words, there's this inner force uh, seeking to have it manifest itself. And uh, Mies van der Rohe wrote, architecture is the real battleground of the spirit. Architecture depends on its time. It is the crystallization of its inner structure, the inner structure of its time, the slow unfolding of its form, so that a time, an era, has an inner structure, and architecture is the crystallization of that inner structure into form. Kahn gave his last talk at uh, Pratt Institute, and when he was done with his talk, speaking in the terms that we've been describing here, a uh, student raised his hand, Kahn called on him, and the student said, why architecture? And what he meant by that was, why are you an architect? Why aren't you a mystical you know, philosopher? And Kahn said, uh, let me attack your question with a Hebraic uh, uh, approach of returning your question. If you ask your question, I then ask you, why anything? And student George uh, immediately snapped back, because it is. And Kahn agreed, yes, because it is. So if you're interested in a more in-depth discussion of uh, Kahn's philosophy, you'll find it in my book, Between Silence and Light.